When people think about the beginning of the Japanese motorcycle dominance and really Japanese motorcycle history in general, they often picture the bikes of the 1970s, particularly motorcycles like the Kawasaki Z1 and Mach 1, and of course, Honda's CB750, along with all the other CBs. That bike in particular, the CB750, is usually thought of as the first superbike, a high revving, production, four cylinder motorcycle providing all of the sportiness and more than the British sport bikes of the day with unrivaled reliability and technology. But I think when people say that it was the first superbike, it actually has more to do with the engine configuration and even the sound. That bike was the bike that started it all for multi-cylinder sport bikes, and when you ride one of those old CB4s, you can tell you're being pulled around by basically the same engine as a modern inline-four sport bike, give or take, you know, about 100 horsepower. But the CB750 wasn't created in a vacuum, it didn't just appear. This wasn't Honda's first sporty production motorcycle, not by a long shot, and if you know anything about Honda's racing history, you know that prior to the CB750 in the 1960s, Honda knew how to make more than just super cubs. Prior to the CB750, there was the CB450, an incredibly innovative, race-inspired, double overhead cam twin, producing 45 horsepower at 9,000 RPM, all the way back in the 1960s. That's more than my 500cc Triumph twin, which only produced 41 horsepower. And yeah, my Triumph doesn't rev to 9,000 RPM. In other words, Honda was already beating the British at their own game before they went and reinvented the game with the CB750. But it goes back even further. The roots of all of this trace back to the motorcycle that we're looking at today, which is the Honda Superhawk CB77, the first Japanese sport bike. Moving into the 60s, the Japanese motorcycle companies were kind of in an interesting place. They were already dominating the little bike market with reliable, sort of utilitarian, and virtually indestructible machines like the Super Cub. These were true world market motorcycles. In 1961, a whopping 1.7 million motorcycles motorcycles came out of Japan, a staggering increase from just 10 years before 1951, where only 11,000 motorcycles were produced. Companies like Honda were absolutely skyrocketing. Honda was really leading the way in all of this for Japan. And they'd already started expanding beyond making simply small, efficient little motorbikes. It was time for the big Japanese manufacturer to offer something more sporty for all of the new riders introduced to life on two wheels from the insanely popular Cub. 50cc bikes were becoming less popular at this time, and really the Benley was the first standout Japanese sporty machine at the time, released just a few years earlier than the bike that we're talking about today. This was a 125 5cc twin born out of their racing development of small capacity high revving machines. The production Benley produced a whopping 11.5 horsepower at 9500 rpm. That's more power than a current 125cc Grom from a machine from more than 60 years ago. With this motorcycle, Honda would establish itself as a premier brand capable of making performance-oriented motorbikes for production. And if the British companies weren't paying attention at this point, which it seems that they weren't, well, they should have been. But you know, who cares about a 125cc motorcycle? We make big bikes. That was sort of the stigma. But it was the next iteration of this platform from Honda that would really put the writing on the wall for all the other companies. Prior to the 60s, Honda had made bigger twins. The C70 and C77 were already released, but they didn't have near the impact of the later CB77 Superhawk and Honda Hawk of 1961, in part because of specs. But I think more than anything, it was the look of this bike. Looks are everything for a sport bike rider. And don't deny it, if you ride, you know, a modern sport bike like a Panigale, and you choose that over, say, a GSX-R1000, it's not because of horsepower. I don't believe that for a second. The Panigale is sexy. And you know what? That's okay. I completely understand that. People want their sport bike to look good. The CB72 and CB77 Hawk and Super Hawk were beautiful machines in their own right, maybe a little bit different and sort of difficult to come to terms with in terms of style in light of later Hondas. It's taken me a bit to really get used to the styling of the Hondas of the 60s, but when you look at the popular 
Honda Benley, which predated the Superhawk, and you see how the styling sort of changed, it really makes sense why this bike was so popular. That large sort of swoopy fender was ditched, the sort of nacelle headlight was ditched, perhaps Honda was learning from Triumph when they got rid of that sort of headlight with the Bonneville. I mean, the Superhawk still kind of had a nacelle headlight, but not as like chunky as before. Nobody riding a cool fast motorcycle really wanted that look. Sport bikes at this time needed to be sleek and simple and stripped down. That was really the future and Honda knew that and they made the Superhawk sort of styled that way. The Hawk and Superhawk had flat handlebars a la something like a Vincent Black Shadow, just very simple, low slung handlebars. Smaller, sleeker side panels, just minimal in all of the right areas with sort of a bit of pizzazz over the other sporting motorcycles at this time. And one of the main areas where it really stood out in terms of design was the motorcycle's color. The Superhawk came in multiple color options, but what was unique is the color that was on the tank and the forks would actually match the frame, which is a bit goofy looking, you know, looking back and not necessarily the way that people usually want their motorcycle to look, but it was really a way for Honda to have this sort of sporty machine stand out. But coupled with an appealing style, the performance was just there. This was a 305cc twin capable of 99 miles per hour, though some tests from that time claimed upwards of 105 miles per hour. Redlining at 9500 RPM, though capable of surviving upwards of 12k with the right mods, and producing a ridiculous 28.5 horsepower. Now I know that might not seem like a lot today, but just for perspective, Triumph's 350cc twin at this time considered sort of the sportiest motorcycle in this class, if you want to say it's a class, produced about 18.5 horsepower. At about the same year that Honda released the Superhawk. So with the Superhawk, you're getting 50% more horsepower or so from a machine weighing almost exactly the same as Triumph's Sporty 350 Twin. Oh, and it actually gets worse. Triumph's 500cc Twin in the early 1960s was also less powerful as well, and in the hands of the right rider, a CB77 Superhawk would humiliate the 500cc British Twin bikes and even hang with the bigger 650 Twins. They handled beautifully, and they had that rugged sort of industrial reliability of all of Honda's bikes at this time. You could outrun any bike on a Superhawk if you just had enough time because the other bike would probably fall apart. The Hawk and Superhawk were more than different on the outside from their predecessors, and it's really the inside that counts. Wet sump engines, a 180 crank versus the 360 degree crank of the Dream models, a higher 9.51 compression ratio for the Superhawk versus the 8.2 to 1 compression ratio of the C77 Dream. Handling was also improved with a new single loop tubular steel frame, plus the engine was now a stressed member. Double leading shoe front and rear brakes, which was actually unheard of on a production bike at this time. Dual carbs helping the Superhawk rev higher and producing power sort of higher in the rev range. This bike was the epitome of high rev small multi-cylinder machines that Honda had basically begun to already perfect for the track and now they were releasing a motorcycle with that formula to the public. And the old saying of win on Sunday, sell on Monday was at least true for the Superhawk in the 1960s. Honda was basically beginning their dominance and their reign. 1960 marked Honda's first Grand Prix World Champion in Tom Phyllis. Honda began to dominate small displacement racing worldwide with, you guessed it, high revving multi-cylinder four-stroke motorcycles. Now I've detailed much of this racing success in a video about Honda's ridiculous 50cc RC116. I'll have a card pop up now if you're at all interested in that, but it really goes through a lot of Honda's success in the 60s. But the Superhawk was a first for Japanese motorcycle companies in that it was a true competitive sport bike for the road that could be purchased with racing upgrades. A Superhawk could easily be turned into a road racing machine with Honda's available YB race kits. This included clip-ons, of course, rear set foot pegs, a racing seat, alloy wheel rims, racing camshafts, and racing carbs. The Superhawk CB77 in this form was the ultimate Japanese sporting machine. Many riders got into racing on this very motorcycle. The Superhawk was affordable in comparison to the British sporting machines of the early 60s. About 600 bucks could get you a Superhawk pretty much anywhere in the US versus a Triumph or BSA or Norton Big Twin, which would run you 
probably over $1,000 even in the early 60s. So for comparison, you can imagine today something like a Royal Enfield Interceptor and how it's only like $6,000, and that's appealed to so many people over the Bonnevilles, which pretty much cost you 10 k or more no matter what, except in this case, the Superhawk was more motorcycle for less money, whereas a Bonneville is still quite a bit more premium than an Interceptor with all of the features and riding modes and just that sort of premium quality. In the early 60s, a Superhawk, for example, had electric start and all sorts of other things that just made it a more reliable and in some ways more premium motorcycle than the other sporting machines that were available, and it was cheaper. But performance wasn't everything for this bike. The Superhawk was easy to maintain and use. It came equipped, as we said, with reliable electric starts and forward rotating kickstarts. Those were somewhat unreliable, but those kickstarts were rarely needed. Plus, it had a rare ability to withstand long periods of riding at high RPMs without exploding and throwing oil all over the road and leaking. Oh, and it also had reliable 12 volt electrics. It had all sorts of things that the other sporty machines at this time, which were basically British and, you know, sort of Italian, but mostly British bikes, it had all the right stuff that those bikes were lacking, which is just ease of use, dead reliability, good solid electrics. It didn't have all the character of those bikes, but a lot of times that doesn't matter when it comes to motorcycles like this. You know, when riders look back at old motorcycles, riders who've experienced the performance machines out of Great Britain, as well as Japanese bikes like the Superhawk, they'll tell you that, you know, the British machines were great, but they weren't Hondas. You know, that's something a lot of people will say. They're awesome, but it's not like they're Hondas. And it's easy to ride a bike like my Triumph 500 and think, man, this is just not like a modern motorcycle, whereas my old Honda CB500 and my dad's old Honda CL350, these bikes feel like modern motorcycles in so many ways. But in the early 60s, that kind of reliability just wasn't a thing. Honda was basically creating that sort of oil-tight, dead-reliable motorcycle. And then, of course, other Japanese manufacturers like Yamaha and Kawasaki and Suzuki, they basically built that sort of new form of motorcycle, the kind of motorcycle that you got on and you just know it's all good. Nothing's going to happen. You're not going to have to tinker with it you know, tonight to be able to ride it tomorrow. Having ridden new motorcycles, I can tell you they don't really feel any different than an old Honda. In many ways, I would put the reliability of an old Honda CB, you know, maybe an old Superhawk or one of the inline fours of the 70s, up against many of the non-Japanese modern motorcycle manufacturers that are available today in terms of reliability. Now, the Superhawk would set the stage for Honda's business model going forwards, high revving multi-cylinder machines, first for the track and then for the road as well. It was also sort of the ancestor to many famous twins think bikes like the CB450 and CB350. These bikes wouldn't exist without the Superhawk. But perhaps one of the great tragedies in Honda's past is their lack of development of this bike through the 60s. It went virtually unchanged as Honda put all of their best engineers and development teams to task on making their race machines better. The Superhawk was so innovative for its time, it didn't really need to be updated that much, and because of this, it had a relatively short life. By the end of its run in 67, it really wasn't competitive with the other twin-cylinder sport bikes, whereas bikes like the 500cc Triumph, those bikes had really upped their power progressively throughout the 60s, and so the Superhawk in some ways started to fall behind. When I was living in Hawaii, I had a neighbor, an older gentleman, who would ride down the street on a motorcycle that to me appeared to be a Honda of the 60s, but that was all that I knew. I knew it was a Honda, and I knew it was sort of that old style pre-1970s. I knew that it was a twin, and I knew it was loud, and I found out later that it was loud because he took the baffles out, and he did that for all of his small displacement 60s Hondas, which he said he had like eight of them, if I remember right. Now this bike was, as far as I know, a Superhawk. I could be wrong, but I'm almost positive that's what it was, except instead of a CB77, it was the later CL77, which was Honda's first foray into making a scrambler, like a proper 
scrambler. So basically, it was a CB77 Superhawk with high pipes, much like the CL350 that my dad owns versus, you know, the CB350s of those times. Now, at the time, I didn't really get the hype, you know, because I didn't know anything about Honda's history prior to basically the CB750. I didn't understand this gentleman's craze with 1960s Honda Twins, but that was all he owned and all he cared about. But now, I think I get it. All that to say, I think that that was one of the first times I really started appreciating the early Japanese bikes. I started to see that this bike really was beautiful and just so different from what I'm used to when I think about classic bikes. When I first got into classic motorcycles, it was all British bikes for me. And, you know, still I think that the British bikes from this time are the best looking motorcycles of all time. But when you give these Japanese bikes some time, they really are incredible, beautiful machines. If you hear one or you watch people ride them, or maybe you've owned one yourself, you know that they're such different machines from the British twins of that time. They're quiet and tight and performance-oriented, while being a bit sort of industrial. They're almost boring in some ways. You know, they're just so tight and simple. But still, for me, one of my favorite motorcycles to ride is my dad's early 70s CL350. It's just such a simple, tight, fun little motorcycle to ride, and it's just perfect. It's reliable. It's what a motorcycle should be, you know? It doesn't have all of the character that my Triumph has in terms of sound and feel and vibe and obviously problems, <laughs> but you can see why people loved these motorcycles. Now, the Super Hawk name would make a comeback in 1997, though the Hawk name had been used before that, but this time it was applied to a motorcycle that was really worthy of the name. This new sport bike was a motorcycle that had an all-new 996cc 90-degree V-twin producing about 110 horsepower, again repping some new innovations like the original Super Hawk, also using a new way to have the engine utilized as a stress member. In this case, the swing arm is bolted directly to the engine. And I was informed about this motorcycle by my Honda mechanic who owns a beautiful super low mile 2005 Super Hawk. And as he said, this is often referred to as a Honda Cotty instead of the classic high revving inline fours known to come out of Japan. And Honda, of course, has their whole history of making V4s. So this isn't entirely new, but this was a spirited, fun, torquey, characterful, sort of Ducati-esque machine for the time. And it really did carry the Super Hawk name with pride, unlike so many new motorcycles taking old names from the past. I'm looking at you, BSA Gold Star. Oh, and actually, Honda is bringing back the Hawk name, which, yeah, probably not going to be as well represented as the Super Hawk of the late 90s and 2000s. Now, when I say that the Super Hawk was the first Japanese sport bike, I'm not really saying that it's the first motorcycle to come out of Japan with any sporting sort of chops. There were bikes before that that definitely paved the way for the Super Hawk, which, as we said before, paved the way for so many other sports-oriented motorcycles. But the Super Hawk stands out not only in its ability to really compete with the British twins of that day, it was the first motorcycle to really prove the Japanese formula on a production motorcycle. More power through more revs. This would carry into obviously the inline fours of the late 60s and 70s and sort of culminate in the CBX, which was even more cylinders and even more power. And even today with Honda's race bikes, this motorcycle was really the first time Honda took the race formula and really sort of rigorously applied it to a production bike, which is the essence of what modern sport bikes are. They're race bikes made for the street. The Super Hawk should have been a lesson for the British companies on what should be focused on in a motorcycle. Style is great, character is great, but in the end, reliability and usability ends up trumping all. Reliable electrics, oil-tight engines, easy, quick electric starts. Honda knew how to do all of that in the 60s, like in the early 60s. And their focus on these things for the Super Hawk was an example of them taking their bulletproof system for smaller bikes and applying it to a more performance-oriented machine. And in this way, I really do think the Super Hawk is really just as much a predecessor to the CB750 as any of Honda's four-cylinder race machines. Without the Super Hawk formula and seeing that it worked, the CB750 wouldn't be what it was. One of the standout features of Cycle World's 1962 review of the Super Hawk is just an astonishment at how quickly Honda turned the tables on everyone in the industry from their initial introduction into the market with rather goofy looking little motorcycles to this new 
Super Hawk, one of the best sport bikes that money could buy at this time. It's just really cool seeing them review it and just see how good it is. They can't help but just be amazed at this motorcycle. Cycle World praises the Super Hawk, a motorcycle clearly born out of their racing achievements. The reviewers just couldn't believe how tight, how oil tight and mechanically tight the engine was. It was the first of its kind, a fast motorcycle, but without all the headaches and pains and just frustration. Sure, you could have a Norton Manx or a Triumph Bonneville or a BSA Gold Star. Those were faster motorcycles for sure. But man, be prepared for a headache and double the price initially. For 650 bucks or so in the early 60s you could have all the power you would ever need for the streets with none of the headaches and the super hawk was that motorcycle that's the kind of motorcycle that builds a reputation you own it and you ride it and your kids and their kids end up buying motorcycles from the same company as long as that company keeps making those kinds of motorcycles because it's a machine that actually stays around it's not a machine that breaks down and dies and you junk it or get rid of it or sell it motorcycle companies that truly push to innovate without needing to see exactly where they're going. Companies like Honda in the 60s and 70s, willing to just push forwards, willing to fail and build bikes that you know may not be exactly what people want or may end up being failures. Those are the companies that can look back 10, 20, 30, 40, you know, 100 years and see that all of their great motorcycles sort of stack on top of each other. Sure, there's a bunch of bikes that are you know short-lived or don't turn into massive successes, but the motorcycles that are really iconic in Honda's history, they really sit on top of each other's shoulders on top of the previous motorcycles before them. And in many ways, that's what the Super Hawk is. It's the ancestor to the modern parallel twin. You know, you have Triumph essentially inventing the production parallel twin, but Honda really perfected it with bikes like the Super Hawk. I've talked about Honda building their business in the 70s, but I hope this video has shown that it really all started with these bikes in the early 1960s. It's these kinds of motorcycles that, in my opinion, really built Honda. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed learning about the Super Hawk. And if you enjoyed this video and this kind of video, I'll have a playlist pop up that you guys can click on to watch a bunch of other videos like this. So hope you guys are doing well. Ride safe.